the, the biggest story and it led your issue is on Vince McMahon. And you wrote that obviously you guys talked about this on Wednesday that he wants back in. And it was so interesting because of the timing of the Wall Street Journal piece. And I just figured like, yeah, he, he's making noise about coming back. So they want to have more information out there, which may make him pause about coming back or may stop people from wanting him to come back. Uh, but that that was pretty fascinating. And and the person, you know, you guys have talked about whoever is, is leaking this information. Uh, but yeah, the timing of this stuff is, is interesting. He is not one step ahead of the game in this scenario in any way. No, it's really fascinating to watch this thing. But I was, um, you know, I, I had not really heard that he was trying to get back in because I thought that it was a really bad idea. And then, you know, the Wall Street Journal broke it. And then I asked around and it's certainly true that he is. And um, it's it's fascinating because it's not in the best interest of the company in, in many different ways. Uh, but it also, you know, again, it's when you think back at Vince, the person, it's it's not a surprise. Uh, yeah. I think that he probably really misses doing this. Um, it was his life. And um, yeah, the idea that he thought that, you know what, I got bad advice and I could have wrote it out. And I'm sure he would think that. And um, and perhaps perhaps he could have. But it, the company also would, have, especially in this day and age, as more and more things came out. The company, even though like from a business standpoint, it would, you know, the, the fans are going to be the fans no matter what. But it's it's from a perception uh, situation as far as to the public at large, to sponsors and everything like that, it would have a real negative taint to the company. But, you know, one of the things that I realized is, is that, um, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it kind of brings out the worst in, in the perception of wrestling, but if he, if he were to come back or just, if he does come back when he comes back and if he goes on television and everyone goes crazy, it's like, you know how wrestling fans are going to be looked at and, and granted it, it may only be a small percentage of them that are the ones in the arena that night and everything, but they will reflect so badly on wrestling fans to the real world. They're going to yeah. go like, look at the sky and now they're cheering him. I mean, it was, it was one thing, you know, um, when those allegations came out and, and that happened and, and that wasn't real negative reflection on, on a group of wrestling fans. And it's kind of, um, you know, I mean, it, re it reminded me, it's not the exact same thing, but it did remind me of a real famous story from, you know, the Bobby Shane story from Jacksonville when, when Bobby Shane died and, and um, he was a top heel in Florida and they announced in Jacksonville, you know, like uh, where, we're, you know, he was supposed to be in on the card that night. You know, he died the night before in the plane crash and they announced that, uh, you know, Bobby Shane passed away and the fans cheered. And, and I know a lot of the wrestlers, uh, and this goes, this, and the, this goes back to the seventies, which is, you know, sickened by by that when they heard that the fans should even though bobby shane was a heel and you know it, it's you know this is not nearly as bad as that i'm not even close but it is something where you know the the, the mob mentality and everything like that of, of a select group of wrestling fans can really reflect badly on wrestling fans to uh the wrestlers and to the public at large uh so this this could be one of those things yeah you know you talked about this a little bit on Wednesday in that if this was a professional sport and the owner was, you know, had all this stuff come out about him, the NBA and the NFL are kind of dealing with a similar situation, yeah. though I don't know to the extent of it because I don't follow that stuff as closely as I follow this, but Robert Sarver with the Phoenix Suns, he is being pressured to sell his team uh, because of his management style and, and, you know, there was a report about uh, how he dealt with individuals and there's some racism involved and stuff. And then Daniel Snyder, yeah. who has just been in a number of these kind of things. Uh, so, yeah, you know, it, it's reflective of, of sort of what's going on in ownership. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know what it means as, as far as what, you know, how the world has changed and what you could get away with back then versus what you could get away with now. But you could uh, get away with a lot more in the past. Some of these skeletons are, are coming back to bite these uh, older guys. Yeah, because they lived in, the, you know, they, they grew up in that period where, where they were bulletproof. And now nobody's completely bulletproof. Um, I mean, if you have money, you're bulletproof to a degree, but but you're not 100 percent bulletproof. Yeah. Uh, so cool. a couple other things. Um, 
So the the Rita Chatterton thing, uh, it's fascinating that this story came back because it was like, I'm trying to think of where I first saw this story written about. Maybe it was ninety two. Like it was ninety. It would have been ninety two. I don't know where you first heard about it. Yeah, but that's uh, when it first surfaced. There, there may have been like a book. Like, was there like a wrestling confidential book or something that had come out? Like there a probably. bunch of old stories from from the eighties and nineties. It may it may have been there, but the fact that there's the New York law that allows for these cases for one year to sort of come back to light is 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 both, fascinating. Both of the cases in the new article have to do with that because there's also a California law that goes into effect January 1st. And that's where the California case that we, I, we had never even heard of um, resurfaced. So, but the Rita Chatterton one obviously is the one that people know the best. And I, I kind of wrote in detail about, there's a lot of ramifications of that. It's, but it's so different because with, with Rita Chatterton, um, you know, there's no fear from Vince McMahon of her revealing anything new because she's already done it. So, you know, there's that. So now it's a it's a different dynamic. And there was a lot of stuff that went down in 1992, you know, when they sued her and, um, you know, over defamation. And, um, you know, that's all kind of coming back too. But but Vince was adamant about not paying her. Yeah. As far as his possible return, the, you, you wrote about the scenarios and and why it's just not as easy as him wanting to say that that he's coming back and you even had a note from somebody close to the situation on why it would be bad for the company uh, but it seems like it's sort of full steam ahead to make sure that this doesn't happen rather than like really wanting him and, and needing him to to come back because they've shown that they don't need him and he's at, he actually was probably a, a detriment in some way to, to business I think he, I think he was in the last couple of years you know as far as like the creative always changing and the mor from a morale standpoint for sure. Um, you could argue, you know, create, you know, creative, but, but if you look at, I mean, business was coming back since WrestleMania and he was still in charge for several months after that. And now, you know, some people will say, oh, look at the, the last two ratings of raw, but the, but also SmackDown did a great rating on Friday. So, and, and I, you know, again, like uh, a, a rating in December or whatever, when again, all ratings are, um, you know, the, the loss of homes, which we'll talk about later is, is a big key factor. Um, I mean, I look at like, again, the most important thing is, is like, how is just to, to see how strong the business is, is like, how is fan engagement? How is the business? And um, I look at, you know, the advances, you know, because that tells me really what fans are and aren't interested in. And WWE is looking really good right now. I mean, yes. every big, every, you know, there are two nights of WrestleMania, the Royal Rumble, the, the show in Philadelphia, the 30th anniversary, the Montreal, two shows in Montreal and just up and down everywhere. You know, the weekly stuff is, you know, like, again, the weekly Mondays and Fridays are fine. They're not knocking them dead every week, although tonight in Chicago is probably going to be a sellout, which is which is rare for, for SmackDown taping. But um, it's it's really, really good. You know, it's not, a, you know, it, it's Chicago, but AEW also just ran Chicago and didn't sell out. So, you know, and in and, and a much smaller building, too. So it's, you know, by and large, when I look at the WWE upcoming business, it's telling me that that the fans are are, are very into the product at a, at a pretty good level, especially with the ticket price being what they are, and so that means that that they're doing good. Um, you know, they're 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 not. You know, the, the, there's enough paying people in in these cities. You know, when when they run a big show, I mean, a lot. So um, I'm not saying that that's all due to to Paul Levesque's creative. It's there's there's a lot of different reasons involved. But they have shown they don't need Vince to do this because this is not Vince stuff anymore. You know what's what's interesting about this? So for years now, you and Brian have been talking about how Vince created a system in which not one performer drives the business. And it's and, really and, no, and not necessary even. And, and the company drives the business. You can also say he created a system in which people under him can run the business without him running the yes, business. Yes, he did. He did. Well, it wasn't that he created the system. The economics changed the system. It's it's the same as UFC. It's it's exactly the same as UFC in the sense that all of these guys that, that built the company, like Lorenzo and Joe Silva and Dana, now, even though Dana's very front and center and everything, like you could take them away 
and the thing will still run. Um, and they don't even have to be the replacements don't even have to necessarily be great at their job because the money's guaranteed. I mean, in the long run, if they tank it, sure. Um, and the same thing could go with wrestling if you tank it, but it's, you know, when you're, the, when you're a major league property, I think that there's limits on how much tankability there is. I mean, you have to be, you know, granted WCW did show us uh, a lesson in the late nineties that you could tank something really, really big, really, <laughs> really fast. But as a general rule, I mean, um, you know, there were periods where WWE, the WWE product was not inspired at all. And, um, you know, they would, you know, they they were, you know, they don't have to, they don't have to give you pay-per-views that you want to buy because the price to watch those pay-per-views is essentially like four ninety nine a month or free, depending on who you are. And, you know, maybe that number will go to, to six ninety nine or nine ninety nine in the future, but it's a very low price for people who, you know, used to debate on the $50 purchase every month. And, uh, you know, so it makes, you know, like if you go in there with a pay-per-view that's not necessarily going to be, you know, highly bought, it doesn't matter anymore, you know, or even if you tank at the house shows, which they're not doing, but even if you do, you know, that's overcome by the television rights. I mean, they're, and, and, you know, WWE is looking good because, uh, they maintain enough of an audience in this very fragmented, uh, you know, you know, this very fragmented world, um, they, they will guarantee you enough of an audience that, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's going to be very, very successful for a long, long, long time, no matter who's in charge. You know, I, I think if you were absolutely horrible at, at doing this, you could tank it. Um, but I don't, I have great faith in the people who are running it right now to not be horrible at it because they're smart people. I mean, they might not be great. They might be great, but horrible. They will not be horrible. They will not make the decisions that will run off the audience like other companies have done in the past. And at the same time, he also helped create the environment or take advantage of the environment, which enabled his competition. Right. Like he he wrote the he showed the playbook of of how to do this. And now tons of stuff had to happen well, I, I don't know Khan. that he I, I don't know that he did that because i think that's like tony khan's knowledge of the television world you know and and his context and everything like that that isn't learning i mean i'm sure he learned a lot from vince but that's not learning from vince i mean the one thing vince did was vince you know and again people in wwe used to always tell me it's like because of what happened with wcw he was always worried about you know, you know, the, you know, even like New Japan, it's like, you're going like, New, how's New Japan really going to threaten him? But it was like, you can't leave even a crack open in the door because WCW, if you look at where they were in 92, 93, they were, they were dead. Yep. I mean, they, they were losing money. They were get they had no fan base. I mean, people would watch them on TV for free, but they weren't paying to see their product. And, you know, not that WWE was knocking them dead after Hogan because they were not, but they were not threatened by them. And then, you know, the, uh, but he left enough of a crack and then Hogan went. And the whole thing was, is like, you can't leave that crack open enough, but he did because there was enough talent that was out there that even, even in stockpiling that he thought had, you know, people who had, you know, he thought had no chance to be superstars because only a certain look and a certain type of person can be a superstar. And by leaving that crack open, yeah, he did leave the door open uh, for Tony Khan and um, you know, but I don't think that that was like Tony Khan copying his playbook as much as Tony Khan saw that there was a unique situation. And it really was like if it didn't happen that year, it wasn't going to happen because those guys were going to end up with WWE. And if if they did, there was no there was it would not have been enough talent. I mean, to build something at the level that, that he was able to build it. Granny, let's do the wrestling report. What do you got today? Put your laughing gear on <laughs> my laughing gear. <laughs> <laughs> what is uh? Wrestle a load. <laughs> and Brian Hawks. I, I don't. That's what Vinny got paid after his show. I don't, I don't know what wrestle load is. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. It's Wrestle Cade. Oh, oh well, that good. makes more sense. Where'd Brian go? <laughs> He's recuperating. <laughs> He's broken. You broke him, Granny. <laughs> Sheesh. I've never. I have. 
If you enjoy these videos, for just $7.99 per month, you can enjoy full-length editions of The Brian and Vinny Show, Wrestling Observer Live, Figure Four Daily with Tom Lawler and Lance Storm, The Mad Men Podcast, Speak Now Pro Wrestling with Denise Salcedo and more, plus hundreds of archived shows, all in beautiful HD. Don't miss out. Join us today.